months now, since 1996. Anyway, I was very young when I was ordained deacon at age 28 and elder at age 30. And in between those two ordinations, I got married. And I married a man who was much older than myself. He was a political science professor. Um, unfortunately, he became very ill. Some of you already know this story. Um, and died. So I was a widow when I was 30. But um, he was very invested. His name was Jack. He was very, very invested in my, he thought it was the coolest thing in the world that I was. So um, I had worked very hard between those two ordinations to qualify for the elders ordination. It's a lot of hoops to jump through, interviews, you gotta write more papers, you gotta do some practice sermons. And, uh, I don't know what you had to do, Janice, but it was quite rigorous, I think. And work under supervision for a couple years. While well, I was in my first church in Chicago. So, um, a class, a possible 23 people who were uh, approved for elders ordination. And um, by that time, Jack was very ill. And uh, tried lots of things, chemotherapy and surgery, and nothing seemed to be working. So, but he, he just had to come. And he was already in a wheelchair by then, he was so weak, he was really not out of bed much. Putting on a suit. He didn't even wear a suit to our wedding. And a tie. And I remember sitting outside the, the um, we were at the Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, Illinois, which is where the conference was held. And we were, the gymnasium, the basketball court, had been made into this big kind of church for the ordination service. Because it was late. And we had, I was supposed to be in there lining up. And he wanted me to, I don't have a tie. I even saw myself. But He came inside. Um, I had someone sitting with him, a wife sitting with him for a while during the service. Then I had to go up and line up with the other ordinary. And I had kept my name at his insistence. And we're up there. from other churches, other clergy who have been important to you, can come up and lay hands on you. So we did that. But then Bishop Jesse Duet, who was an old socialist, incredibly progressive, he looks out I didn't even know he knew my, who my husband was. But he looks out in the congregation and he sees that my husband was kind of slumped over in the wheelchair. And I wasn't sitting So he made me skip the line and come up and be ordained right then. I see that my husband was not doing very well. And how could he see that there are 100 people in this room? Over when I was ordained, uh, my own superintendent took Jack in his wheelchair up the elevator. So that's what kind of, and of course, to me, 
says, oh, that annual conference. You all are members of this church, some of you. I'm a member of the annual conference. And I experienced that. So our, our service today is all about come and see. It's all about what Bishop Jesse DeWitt did. Whom you may not know. And somehow overcoming those barriers just through the powers of perception and paying attention. So let's start with our song, Open My Eyes. Uh, this is a good old gospel song, 454, in the, in the big black hymnal, or it'll be on the screens as well. came to a Samaritan city called Sychor, which was Joseph. Jacob's well was there. A Samaritan woman, woman came to the well to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me some water to drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy him some food. The Samaritan woman asked, What are you, a Jewish man? Ask for something to drink from me, a Samaritan woman. The Jews and the Samaritans did not associate with each other. Jesus responded, If you recognize God's gift, and who is saying to you, Give me some water, you would be asking him, and he would be giving you living water. The 
The woman said to him, Sir, you don't have a bucket, and the well is deep. Where would you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave this well to us, and he drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the, from the water that I give will never be thirsty again. The water that I give will, will become in those who drink it a spring of water that bubbles up in eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will never be thirsty and will never need to come here to draw water.
Many Samaritans in that city believed in Jesus because of the woman's word when she testified. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there too because of his word. And they said to the woman, We no longer believe because of what we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is diamond in the rough. He sees people, he sees me, he sees you exactly as we are. People, even people to whom others might find just plain invisible. I think we rush to judge, we assume as the disciples did, apparently, that this woman was a sinner. Now if she had really been, think about this, if she had been an adulteress, wouldn't have she been stoned by now? That was the normal practice, and that was the death by stoning, horrible death. That was what it was called for in the Torah. But if she had been a prostitute, on the other hand, why would she say she had five husbands? It was kind of being undesirable. The divorce laws in Samaria probably would have been the same, I would think, um, in, as in Israel, even two peoples were Jews and Samaritans detested each other would never even share a drinking glass they did read the same laws women in those days could not divorce end of sentence they had no legal standing no. but men could divorce extremely easily a guy could just open his eyes any one morning and behold his wife and if he found her displeasing in any way, all he'd have to do is take a little bit of parchment and write, I divorce you, and she was gone. Ancient, her fault, divorce law. A woman could be sent packing if her husband found her undesirable in any way. Not pretty enough, burned the barley cakes once too often, 
But most often, it was probably because the couple failed to have any children. And of course, it was assumed to be the woman's problem. And she was labeled barren and divorced. I'm just kind of wondering whether this poor woman did that five times. You would think she would have given up by now. She's kind of between a rock and a hard place because a woman by herself in that culture had no resources, literally. You could not live alone. So some man apparently So I'm thinking that maybe this woman is not a sinner any more than you and I ever. How could you not be, having gone through all that? Someone who has lost in love, someone with a painful past, becomes more difficult to distance ourselves. Obviously, I'm not like that. But we know lots of people like this woman, don't we? I'm thinking about an old man which I served once. He wouldn't let anyone into his house because he hadn't changed anything since she'd been there. Every dish, every piece of furniture was exactly as it was when she had left the house. kid we might know, quiet and sad, never really wanted, acts out occasionally, not hard to see why. We know this lonely person, don't we? We know lots of people like her. We might even be her ourselves sometimes. The story doesn't name her, but we could. I, I propose the name Eleanor Rigby. You know that song, right? All the lonely people. From now under the hot noon into the sight of this lonely person's life, and his name is Jesus. Jesus had to pass through Samaria, the hated country of a rival, on his way to Galilee. He comes to Sychar. He sits down in the heat of the day by the well, and a woman comes along with a water jar, and Jesus asks her for a drink. So far, so good. Now, I think one of the nicest things you can do for someone that you don't know well, especially if you kind of sense that they have a low opinion of themselves, or maybe has been ask them to join you in a project. It says to you, it says to them, I recognize you as a person. You and I can be associates. You can help me. If it's done in the right way, it can be a way to affirm someone's dignity. So you can see that this woman has a pitifully low opinion of herself. She's kind of taken in and swallowed all that rejection. It's hard not to. You can see that by her initial reaction to Jesus' request. Well, how can you, she's thinking, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan, and a woman, in other words, so much trash, for a drink? I can see Jesus thinking, how low. And he said, And I'm different from all those other guys. If you could only see what I have to offer you. You must have known there's a real danger that this woman had been so beaten down that she will not be able to receive his gift. There is a real danger that she will turn away in total distrust. But we breathe a sigh of relief. She gives him a chance. She's intrigued by this mysterious talk of living water, which is really just a way to say it's not stagnant, it's moving. You know it's, it's good water to drink. She tells him what no doubt he already knew. This well is not an ordinary well. This is Jacob's well. This is a holy place for her people, a place of deep memory and reverence. Her response reveals what, that she's, where she has gotten the strength to go on. Here she's come to this well alone. Do you have a place like that? A place where you can go when you're at your lowest. Some strength, some quiet. I hope you have a place like that, a place to collect yourself. This well is deep, she says. Are you greater than our ancestors? Where did he get this living water? She's got to know. She's intrigued, mystified, a little baffled. Jesus' answer in turn 
is also intriguing, motioning to the well to the holy place. Everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I shall give them will never thirst for the water that I shall give them will become in them a spring of water well enough to eternal life. Somehow Jesus has that amazing ability to look beyond the surface of us and go deep within as if we were a well ourselves. He's seen what this well has meant to her, a solace, a strong, a source of strength, but he knows that that well will not really conti continue to quench this woman's thirst. She's, because she's thirsty for more than water, right? What would you say this woman's thirsty for? What do you think? Love? Companionship? Friendship? Compassion? Someone just to really see her, because she feels invisible. She is invisible thirsty for someone to accept her just barren maybe she's had this kind of checkered past to look at in the first place or but her thirst has become like a black hole with just sucking up everything in its path and we know people like that are kind of hard to be with sometimes and they are sometimes in our own life I am because everyone within reach has just become somebody to try to to get something from it. it's hard. But Jesus sees this black hole for what it is and offers gently but firmly to replace it with its polar opposite, a spring, well enough to eternal life. He's going to do a little replacing, like an installation right there. And that creates its own water. It will never run dry to be located in her. A source of new and ever renewing life and love and hope and energy. In other words, there's a healing. Folks, you thought this was a long dissertation on theology. Well, this is the healing going on right there by Jacob's well. He's offering to heal that gaping wound deep down within her and install a very bottomless well of love, which will fill to overflowing and enable her once more to love others and to give that love away. Does this woman understand what Jesus is offering her? Well, we don't really know, but she's willing. She's open, surprisingly open. Sir, she says, give me that water. So I don't, she's very practical. I don't have to come, come here again and again to get water. Then comes the clincher, and we can hear her draw in her breath sharply as she, he says, go call your husband. Why does he do this? Seems a bit cruel when we know he knows everything about her past. And then she didn't have a husband. And yet he says, go call her husband. But I think in effect Jesus is saying, I need you to say out loud what's really real with you. For each other. Do we hear that from each other? Do we feel like we have to pretty? So that we can say that to each other. Can, I know you all. For each other. It's, it's human nature. We want, us, we want ourselves to look good in front of people. But he's saying, I want you to say out loud what's really going on with yourself, I think. God is that one who sees us exactly as we are. Don't forget, just in a little while, Jesus is going to be the known as the one who is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. God is the one who sees us exactly as we are, who knows all about us, our triumphs, our tragedies, all about our pain, who loves us completely, unconditionally, right down to our most microscopic cell. From God's perspective, we must look a little bit like that striped woolly caterpillar you find around this, this time in the spring, sometimes on the sidewalk all curled up tight, tight and defensive, not a bit of that soft flesh showing. If you ever picked one up, if you're very gentle and still, sometimes from the warmth of your hand, it will start to uncurl a little bit. And then when God surrounds us with the warmth of that divine love, divine acceptance, we can feel ourselves begin to uncurl and relax a little bit more. And feeling the strength of that hand beneath us, we start to trust. And then we say, well, oh, I don't know, what about this? And we curl back up a little bit and, and point to something we 
Sure, we want to acknowledge some deep dark secret that we've curled around thinking maybe God doesn't really know about that. And God says, well, I do know about that. I see right through, through and through, and I love you anyway, just as you are. And so we uncurl some more, and as we do, we allow ourselves to remember a few more unpleasant things that make us draw breath in again. What about this broken relationship, rejection, a situation we handle badly? God says, I knew about that when it was happening, and I love you nevertheless. And the more we uncurl, the more of ourselves we reveal, the more hurts and shame and painful past we let into God's healing light. The more God says, I love you anyway. There isn't anything you can do or say ever that can make you make me stop loving you infinitely. And before long, what was a black hole inside of us has become a spring. Welling up to eternal life. It's a, it's a deep subject, isn't it? How can we tell that we've begun to uncurl, to trust ourselves, all of ourselves, to God, to each other? We become lighter. See how light this woman of Samaria has become? She's so light, she's running. She's radiant, lighter than air. And there this woman goes, running back to her village to call everyone, everyone, come, come and see, come and see this man who told me everything I've ever done. Come and see, could this be the Messiah? Come and see. The first woman preacher in history. I remember in seminary, I was my seminary roommate my first year. It was a little difficult to get along with. All the time. And I, I did my best, and we kind of figured it out. And then we both went away. I guess that was my second year, because we both went away for internships. And when she came back, she went to a college internship in Illinois. I literally didn't recognize her when she was walking down the hallway the first day of school. Because she, this person was glowing. She was so radiant. She was like lighter than air. And I said, Maria, is that you? What happened to you? You look wonderful. I love you. I thought you looked wonderful before, but I mean, we've been communicating by letter, but I hadn't really caught up. And she said, well, I, I decided, you know, I found out I'm gay. I found out I'm lesbian. And I decided I love myself just the way I am. And I was like, well, well, good. <laughs> Hallelujah. She really figured it out, and she wasn't anymore, and she was ready to to be a pastor, and she is a pastor, and she's a wonderful pastor. Just like the man in this book who also made the same, came out to his congregation, the very first testimony in this book, he says, I'm, I feel radiant, lighter than air. So as we are healed, as we begin to uncurl, may we see with the eyes of Jesus that everyone, even the invisible ones, even those who seem to be having a real difficulty among us, can become springs of living water. Could that happen here? It does happen here. Come and see. And now as we go around to pass the peace, in this congregation we often like to get up out of our seats and do a little fist bump, rubble bump, hug, shake hands, say good morning, say the peace of Christ be with you. Or you can stay right in your seats and have others come to you. So. May God's peace be passed between us out of that spring of love that's within each other.
So, we're almost back in our seats, which is good. It's good to see everyone well got. Last night it rained and there was actually not too much rain, so it was refreshing. But it could be worse. It's probably still raining at least somewhere in Texas, where more families are needing to find shelter or put their lives back together. In Paris, it's the uh, flooding is the worst in 30 years, so they're taking the art uh, out of the lower parts and putting them in the upper levels of the Louvre. In North Africa, people probably are going to, more people will die trying to cross the Mediterranean to Europe. And others in camps are living in tents waiting for their life to get back together. Uh, and yet, in the midst of this, there are signs of hope. Always signs of hope. And here, in this congregation, Cheryl Asher has a new baby in her family. Uh, Jackson Lewis, let's see, I think, Fink, was born uh, on Saturday, and his mom, dad, and parents were in the prayers last week, healthy nine pounds and 14 ounces, 22 inches long, and the first grandchild on both sides of the family, so everyone is thrilled. And so we thank you for the signs of hope that allow us to keep going when it may seem difficult. So now let us close with a prayer that our Lord left with us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And as we have the uh, presentation of gifts by the ushers, uh, they're going to sing, Fill My Cup, Lord, uh, which the words will be on the screen. And if you're trying to find them in the hymnal, they're actually going to be number 641, which is different from what is printed there. So the ushers can come forward.
uh, keeps the doors open and allows us to bring new signs of hope. Amen. In our communion service, um, if you want to sing along on the song responses, uh, they can be found in the little black book at the faith we sing. Um, otherwise, we just join right in. It's kind of a call and response in the beginning. The Lord be with you.
here in Lesnar County, Austin River and Albany. Wherever we are, let us share your ministry together as we feast at this heavenly banquet. Let us be fueled and ready for that ministry. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours. Almighty God, for now and forever. Thank you. 
sang a hymn. We're going to sing number 664, sent forth by God's blessing. It'll be on the screens. But I forgot to mention that um, everyone is very welcome to go right back through here and take a right to coffee hour right after the awesome fellowship time. We have snacks for those with food allergies as well as um, lots of other things. And just conversation. Time to tell a little storytelling of our own. So we hope you'll join us today right after the last, last blessing. Set forth by God's blessing.